debugger as well. Uh, it's the binomic plague. It's a picture of the binomic plague. Um, yeah, like uh, Martin said, I'm Frank Bredijk. If you want to reach me, my, uh, my details are on there. Um, so this talk is about the human immune system, but also immune system as it's found in other animals and how it relates to info security and what we can learn from it. And the basic, very basic immune system is the non-specific immune system. And it consists of two parts. But first of all, it consists of barriers. And those barriers are things like our skin. I wouldn't look uh, as pretty, well, uh, as I would if I didn't have any skin on. But more importantly, I would get infections very quickly. And, and it would probably be very painful for me. Um, but it's also things like our stomach acid, which helps us ingest stuff, and the acidic, acidic oil on our skin, which also helps out uh, keep out intruders. And in a sense, it's a way like our firewalls, like our intrusion prevention systems, our antivirus, and all the other stuff we've been doing since decades. And in the old style, in the old days, that was really how we approached security. Um, we approached security as an egg. It had a hard shell and a soft center. Um, it's also referred to as the M&M model. And, and that approach doesn't work anymore. And, and, and I guess with the high amount of security people here, that, that goes without saying. But it's not due to, it's, it's also due to how the world has changed. This was the situation as it was in the old days. You had a data center. Everything was in, within the walls of data center castle. And everything was hunky-dory. And then we started outsourcing, or nowadays we, we use software as a service, which is more or less the same thing. Uh, we use platform as a service. Uh, also, we bring in our telephones to work. And it used to be landlines. It used to be simple devices. Now they're portable computers, and people take them in, take them into the network, take them out of the network again. And obviously, when I'm at home, when I'm in the comfort at my home, I want to be able to connect to everything I can connect to when I'm in the office. Uh, speaking of those pesky end users, um, they want to work in the office. They want to work outside the office. They don't really want to experience a difference. So you need to have another connection. And then there's business partners. And that could be your developers offshore. It could be companies you do business with, um, whatever. If you need to exchange data, there's probably a link there. Of course, we have our end users interacting with our, with our web servers or um, doing some other interaction. And then there's things like the Internet of Things. It's no longer just my phone that has an IP address. It's my watch, it's my Fitbit, it might be the soles of my shoes, or it might be my refrigerator trying to be intelligent and ordering me food. I've even heard some rumors about IP-connected toilets this morning. So, yeah, the egg has hatched. And what has appeared from it may not be something that appeals to us instantaneously. Talking about an egg, we're actually not that good in making good eggshells. We're still fighting cross-site scripting. And, and OS was almost fighting as long, cross-site scripting as long as I've been in InfoSec formally. Now, for the next slide, I have to apologize to my friends of mine who are in a red team and who are doing good work. But to be honest, with a red team, we're now, red team, blue team approach, we're now just proving that if you take an egg and you drop it, you can break the shell. And then it's the blue team that wraps up the egg a little bit better, and the red team that smashes it a little bit harder, and then the blue team that packs it a little bit better, and the red team that smashes it a little bit harder. And in the end, this is a battle that is never going to stop. There is a time, there is a place for red teaming, but it isn't the single solution. And this is where we can really learn from, from nature, because Humans don't have, have, have a hard shell. They're, they're not wrapped in bubble wrap, except these poor little kid here. Um, humans ingest parts of their environment. We just did. We just had lunch. It was a good lunch. Do I know what's in it? No. 
Do I trust my body to handle it? Yeah, pretty much. And, and humans themselves interact in funny ways as well. I've shaken hands with some of you. Um, don't like to go any further than that, but use your imagination of what other interactions you have. Not all of them are that safe if you look at them bacteriologically. And to be honest, while we do get sick, and we don't get sick that often, um, we manage not to die a whole lot of times. And that's because of our immune system. And it's not just because of the barriers. Barriers are just a part of it. Another part of it is, is about our incident responders. And there's an immediate first response, and that's inflammation. The minute you have a wound, it gets inflamed. The temperature rises, there's increased blood flow to there, and it's a mechanism to get materials there to repair the problem. Also, it's a means of making it a little bit harder for the attacker. Now, contrary to the myth that Star Trek started, you don't get rid of a virus in your body just because you get a fever. It just slows it down. It's other parts that get rid of the virus. Uh, but it does help slow the virus down. And then the real firefighters come in, and those are your phagocytes. They're, your white, they're, they're a specific kind of white blood cell. And what phagocytes do is, is they have a general idea of what a virus looks like, what a bacteria looks like. They go hunt it, and they go and fix it. And this is what it looks like. We've reached containment, and we're eradicating the threat. And your vulnerability has almost been patched. This, this is what incident response like, looks like. Actually, this is what it feels like. <laughs> this is what goes on in your body. It's awesome. And you don't even see it because you need a microscope to look at it. Um, so, so it's comparable to what we do in incident response, but, but there's a part that we're missing. And to understand the part that we're missing, we need to look at this picture of, of how the immune system works. So on the top left there, you, you have your, antibody, your antigens, which are your foreign body parts, uh, parts that are foreign to your body. Sorry, foreign body parts is something else. Um, and, and they're eaten by a white cell. And what a white cell does is when it eats an antigen, it represents a receptor on the outside. And that receptor is um, it's represented to other white blood cells. And they're your T and B lymphocytes. And what they do is they look at how that funny bit that's sticking out there is, is formed, gen create something that really fits to it, and put that on their outside and multiply. Multiply very quickly, and then release those funny bits that fit on, on the horn, so to speak, of your antigen, and release it in your bloodstream. They attach, they twist it around, something funny happens to the DNA of the antigen, and it dies. That's the B lymphocytes. The T lymphocytes do something very similar, but they look at infected cells. When a cell is infected, it's also representing these receptors outside, Again, it will create fitting parts, but it will kill a whole infected cell. It's like shutting down a virus-infected computer. So antibodies and effector cells really fit the vulnerability that you just found. But because you have antibodies in your, in your bloodstream constantly, this is why you only get the smallpox ones. This is why all those funny DCs you get as a kid, you only get them once. Once you have them, you have the antibodies, and the threat is neutralized before it can get to you. The bull is taken by the horn, it's forced down before it can hurt you. And that's really one of the good feedback loops that is in the immune system that I think we're missing in info security. Um, and the body's full of feedback loops. There's things like pain. Pain is a signal that, that gets sent to your body. It's like that cactus you're leaning on. It's probably not a good idea. You might want to take your hand out. 
uh, but also bad taste. It's like what you're about to eat is not good for you. Then you have your moderate loop, which is like the creation of the antibodies. And you have a long loop, and that's the evolutionary loop. And as Josh likes to, uh, likes to say, survival isn't mandatory. Actually, it's good if every now and then somebody dies and learns from their mistakes. Other part of healthcare, really cornerstone that really helped the human race progress, was the discovery of antibiotics. Now, antibiotics are a great thing if your body is not able to produce enough Anti, enough uh, antigens or, uh, sorry, enough antibodies or is not able to produce them quickly enough. And just to prevent that you die, you get a shot of antibiotics. Every bacteria that comes in place there is killed. But at least you have time to, to survive and recover the good bacteria that were killed as well. So, Great story about how your body works, fascinating stuff, but how does it relate to InfoSec? Well, like I said, we have our barriers. We have things like firewalls, there are things like web application firewalls. Uh, like uh, most people here, I have a love-hate relationship that's predominantly hate, but there's also some love. Um, there's your intrusion prevention system, and they're all based on minimizing your exposure. What isn't there cannot be attacked. What is blatantly um, ill behavior, what's blatantly a virus, needs to get killed before it gets into the network. And then we get to the, the feedback loops. And to be honest, the feedback loops that we have in a lot of production systems are way, 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 way too slow. You got a developer writing some code on his laptop, testing it locally, you get to do, yay, it works on my laptop phase. You commit it. Um, hopefully it gets picked up by some sort of build system, which may or may not run some unit tests on it. Um, it then gets tested by functionality by the product owner. Um, that product owner, looks at what can I release and will build up a big chunk of all the changes that we're going to put in a release. Now hopefully that release is going to be put in some sort of acceptance environment where it's going to be pen tested. And that's usually when the feedback loop happens. <laughs> and it's great, but what part of a lemon is actually not tasting that well? I don't know, I don't know, was it, was, it, was it the change I made to the cross-site request forgery token, or was it the change that I made to this password field, or was it a dumb idea to ask for the last four digits of your phone number as, as your password? I don't know anymore, but this sure wasn't right. And everybody who's ever learned anybody or any animal anything knows that the quicker the feedback loop, the better the learning effect. So in InfoSec, we need, in InfoSec, in application security, in any build system, we need quicker feedback loops. Red team is nice, but a typical red team exercise takes days, weeks, even months. We want something that tells us what did we do wrong in this commit today. And there's plenty of tools out there. I've, I've seen a lot of vendors there. I'm not going to do a specific plug anything specific, um, look at the open source tools as well. And another big part of this, where you want to increase the speed of your feedback loop, is subcomponents, the code that you didn't build. And where that used to be in custom software, it used to be 5%, 10%, used to be the compiler, maybe. Now, 80 to 90% of all the software that's put out there the lines of code are actually not your lines of code, but they're things like jQuery, they're things like the OpenSSL libraries, they're things like your web server, and you should not use vulnerable subcomponents. Now, the last keynote of today will address that particular issue, so I'm not going to dive into, into the depth here. I'm going to dive into another depth. And that's we suck at learning from others. And, and it's conferences like this where we can really go and share best practices, where we can learn from what we've done well and learn from what is not going well. 
Um, we need to do more peer reviews on your code. It should actually be best practice for you to check in your own code. We have great experience with a model where we don't check in our own code. But when one developer writes the code, creates a pull request, and that pull request is actually pulled in by another developer who does a review. Granted, not all, secure, not all application developers are security people. I really like to get to that stage. I'm pessimistic if we'll ever get there because I know I suck as a programmer. So I guess that if I can't learn to decently program, and I've been taught a lesson in humility, uh, humility there recently, um, if I can't be a proper front-end developer, I can't expect a proper front-end developer to be a true security specialist. But there's simply not enough room for us to review everything. And include security in your, in your Scrum team, in your Agile team, and, and make sure that they are there with sprint planning, that they are there when you need them. But they're not going to fix your problem. If they have to read your every single change, this is the process they're going to use. So testing, back to testing. Um, that feedback loop needs to be good. That guy's probably never going to do that again, except in this, this little movie. Um, learn from the failures of others. The Darwin Award is really a great instrument for improving security. But also learn from good examples. Visit conferences, develop methodologies that do work. Now, I said we had incident response, and I compared it to, to the amoeba eating, eating the antibodies. Um, we, as security people, um, learned how to do incident response. And, and last year we had, in the previous years, the years before 2014, we had zero to one hair on fire um, critical bugs that broke the entire internet. And zero that had a logo. In 2014, we actually had about six or seven. Some people had to deal with eight of those types of incidents. So we really need to speed up incident response. That means we really need to know what our software is built of. But we need to remember that it's not just about finding a flaw that could be exploited and then fixing that and demonstrating, hey, you can, you can break in here, now we fix it. We also need to do that, close that feedback loop. So what is that feedback loop? It's taking the knowledge that we've learned from analyzing the vulnerability, from how the vulnerability has affected us, and taking it into our WAF system, saying, hey, for now, I need more time. But also putting it into unit tests and shorten that feedback loop to our developers. So quick question, who knows what this signature works against? So snort signature, WAF, uh, IPS signature. Anybody? Yeah, shell shock. This was indeed shell shock. Now leaving that in there is going to lead to false positives. It's going to hurt me, just like a shot of antibiotics is going to hurt, but it's a pretty good band-aid. It stops me from bleeding, stops other germs from getting in and gives me time to actually patch and figure out where I'm actually bleeding, where I'm actually, what the underlying issue is. And the underlying issues I've taken from example, um, one of the things we do at Schubert Fillers is that we build our images for our cloud via an automated process, via Jenkins. And we actually put in unit tests to say whenever we deploy a new machine, whenever we create a new template, it shall never be vulnerable to Shellshock again. And this is, the, this is the unit test, and I realize this is not a retina screen, so it's a bit hard to read, but it, it's really, an, a, yeah, the shell strings that were there to say, hey, is this a machine, have I created a machine that is vulnerable to shell shell? Another practical example, um, I need to, yeah, this is a, Tests that we put into, we, we create a, a portal where we have to work with authenticated and unauthenticated users. And this is a test, unit test, where we go, first of all, let's log out from the web page. 
and see if we're trying to get anything from this web page, it should fail. If we try to put anything, it should fail. If we try to post, patch, or delete anything, it should fail. Then the next thing we do is that we set up a user, called admin in this case, with a very familiar password. Don't worry, that's test data. Um, log out, log in, and see, OK, can we read this URL? It should be OK. If we try to put, it should be unauthorized. And the list here is very long, but we do put this in every API endpoint. We write those unit tests. Actually, we write those unit tests first, and then we implement the API endpoint to see that we never, ever going to create an endpoint that will allow unauthorized access. Now, this is another example provided by a colleague of mine, which has to do with cross-site request forgery uh, tickets. And here's a bit of code that does the cross-site request forgery ticket. Um, I don't need to explain what a cross-site request forgery ticket is. Here, I hope. Uh, if I do, OWASP has excellent documentation on it. But this is the code, and this is actually just a little snippet of the unit test. And again, what we're trying to do here is trying to get a request saying this request should be granted, but there's also test cases there. There's actually one test case where it says it should be granted, and I think there's eight test cases there where it says it should fail. And that's really a key practice that we need to change. We need to look at the negative space. You need to learn to look at the negative space as well as the positive space for unit tests. Do we see the face or the faces? Do we see the face or the faces face in the face? And it's really a new skill because a lot of the testing that we do is for functionality. It's for the positive space. Um, I mentioned antibiotics as well. And every now and then, and we've seen a number of examples today already, but every now and then you come across a practice where you simply have to say no. Some people, some things are just plain stupid, and you have to say, we're not going here. Um, every time security says no, remember you're putting the no in innovation. Saying no too often makes security the department of no. And you don't want to be the department of no. But there are some resources where you really, really, really want to have sign off from security. And that's your crown jewels. Those are parts of your infrastructure that are so critical that if somebody changes them, they always want to have them reviewed by security. And there's ways to do it. Um, again, using your favorite build tool, and we use Jenkins, but there's others out there as well. Put signatures on your critical code. Make sure they don't get overloaded, and there's ways to do that as well. Now, if a code gets in and it's changed and the signature doesn't man, that means the build will fail. Jenkins says no. Do a peer review. Let the peer reviewer re-sign the code check it back in, and your build should be OK. And that's a mechanism of not only allowing this, but also helping it to make auditable that for certain parts of your code, peer reviews actually do happen. So that's where I learn. Is this everything? Will this fix all our problems? No, it's not everything. This is info security, and reality every now and then has a little surprise for us. So to summarize why I think we need to change, what we need to change is the days of InfoSec Island or the data center castle have ended. If you didn't realize that, that's OK. Survival isn't mandatory. Um, security needs to align our tools. We need to get off InfoSec Island. We need to go towards you, and that's, that's why we're here. That's why I try to talk at, at regular developer conferences as well. We need to go towards you and align with your tools, the tool set you're used to, to help you do your job better. 
And then we need to act really as the immune system. That means we need to help stop blatantly offensive elements. If somebody's trying to, trying to put or one equals one in a password, he's probably not up to good, or he's a security researcher. Um, we need to provide early feedback to you guys so that you know what you did wrong, why you, why you did it wrong, why it is an anti-pattern you're using, another pattern. And we need to help clean up infections and feed it back into our resistance to make sure that we don't repeat our old mistakes. Now, I'm really a big fan of DevOps, and this is what, in a sense, what DevOps is about. It's about system thinking. Security is not an island, it's not a silo. It is part of the system, and we need to stop treating it like it's something special. Yes, it's a special skill. No, it's not a special department. We need to close our feedback loop, amplify our feedback loops, and make sure that if we do something stupid, something will prevent us. Measure the hell out of it, use those measurements to prevent mistakes. And allow for experimentation. We're not the department of no. We should allow this experimentation to happen. Security can't be bolted on. It should be built in. And therefore, it should become a normal process. I really need an acknowledgement. I'm not an expert on antibiotics. I'm not an expert on the immune system. So I'd really, really, really like to thank my friend, Dr. Yuck. Uh, believe it or not, this guy used to be a colleague of mine and used to be a registered EDP auditor until he found out that he likes medicine better and he's now a licensed MD. He's a good friend of mine and given that his motto in life is that a dirty mind should enjoy forever, this slide deck turned out pretty tame. So that was my message. It was shorter than I anticipated, but I'm really not going to make a lot of fuss about it. So, again, if you need to contact me, this is where I, uh, where I can be reached. This is there some time for questions? There are microphones in the room that makes it easier to understand them. So whoever has a question, please step up to the microphone. Not all at once. I, I, can't, I can't believe I've been that clear. <laughs> okay, so we have some extra minutes spare. The hack session will continue here. And the other sessions as in the rooms as uh, earlier today. One remark. There are people who have uh, gluten allergy, uh, gluten allergy, lactose-free, nut allergy, and kosher food. There are special diet lunch boxes available for every break. So please make sure you pick them up. So we have to take care of that. Same is for social event. All diets is taken care of. Vegetarian are okay. Uh, only nut allergy, gluten-free, and kosher, they have different lunch boxes. So make sure you get them. Thank you.